I say this, well, maybe to mock, maybe to have a laugh, but to also ask a very serious, straight question. Uh, got some clips coming up from CPU, which is a gathering of clowns. I think it stands for Sea Clown or Sea Circus, but the thing I don't really understand, whether it's CPAC 24, CPAC 23, CPAC 22, why is there always so much anger, moaning, that the world is so bad, doom and gloom? Even when former guy, Diaper Don was in charge, it was spreading doom and gloom. If anything, I'm glad that they have this gathering of just, you wouldn't want to be near them. They're not suffering from depression or anything like that. They are just miserable kits. And uh, Matt Schnapp, interesting. Matt Schnapp, this is the man who's got an opinion about everything uh, apart from those allegations. But of course, uh, Mercedes Schnapp. Why is she turning a blind eye to everything? We're not allowed to ask about Matt Schlapp's allegations? Anyway, feel free not to watch any of this. Thank you so much. Thank you, CPAC. It's great to be with a group of hard-working American patriots who love their country, love freedom, and love their faith. And our nation was built by men and women who never backed down, never gave up, never ever apologized for who they are. It is this American spirit that lives on in patriots like you. And it's comforting to see so many people who keep the spirit of 1776 alive. But as we gather here today, I really want to discuss an entirely new threat to our country. Just a few miles up the road in Washington, D.C., an entirely different scene is unfolding. Our government and our legacy institutions are losing credibility in the public eye at breakneck speed, even though their systematic takeover of America has been going on for years. The federal bureaucracy, the mainstream media, academia, Hollywood, big tech, and every other nexus of power in America today has turned this fire against conservatives, against Christians, against anyone who stands in their way. I call this a crisis of legitimacy in the United States government. America was founded on the notion that all political power comes from the consent of the government and that sovereignty does not belong to any one official or institution, but it belongs, belongs to we, the American people. The reality, the reality is that the government in Washington, D.C. no longer represents the people it claims to serve. And it has stopped even pretending to execute the charge laid out by our founders, the protection of life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Put simply, Washington is losing its legitimate claim to govern the American people. Millions of Americans look around and wonder, what's becoming of their beloved nation? They don't recognize the place that they grew up in, and they wonder what kind of future is in store for their children and grandchildren. Young men, particularly young white men, aren't signing up in great numbers for military anymore because they don't want to fight for a country that hates them. They don't want to die halfway around the world to protect the borders of Ukraine or Taiwan or any other country on the earth when our own border is being overrun by the millions with terrorists and cartel members and human traffickers coming in every day. They don't want to join a fighting force that is more concerned with woke activism gender inclusivity, LGBT issues, than it is with protecting Americans. They don't want to be part of an operation that spends trillions of dollars abroad while the small towns they call home are falling into dissolution and our communities are being ravaged by drugs and depression while their jobs are shipped overseas without a second thought. And they don't want to fight overseas just to come home to a country hell-bent on vindictive identity politics 
that promises to take what little social and economic capital they have left and redistribute it to racial, sexual, religious, and other minority groups as a pure power play by the radical left. Who can blame them? And how long can a country last in that way? It isn't just happening in our military either. As we see every day, virtually every single institutional power in our country has become openly hostile to conservatives, to Christians, to our country's legacy, and even the concept of Western civilization itself. Our education system has been taken over by radicals who push insane political ideologies like CRT, DEI, transgenderism, and more on our poor children while they no longer even learn basic reading, math, and civics. They come down with the full force of the law when a student tries to open a Bible or say a prayer in school. And you know, they're putting all this stuff over on our young people who have brains that are not fully developed yet. And to take somebody who's curious and impressionable and infect them with these kinds of things is nothing less than child abuse. Uh, well, inflation, gas prices have risen so high that everyday American families struggle to even put food on the table and gas in their cars. And Washington's solution, double down on insane environmental policies like the Green New Deal, mandatory electric vehicles, even though other countries pollute at far higher rates than we do. And we're sitting on some of the largest untapped oil reserves in the world. Our borders are wide open. An estimated 10 million illegal aliens have invaded our country since Biden took over, which is more than the population of 40 of the 50 states. A civilization cannot sustain itself this way, and we have no idea who these people are. They could be terrorists, spies, cartel members, or human traffickers, and they appear to be mostly military-age males. They could be affecting things like our cell phone systems, and whether they work appropriately every day. And I guarantee you, there's a whole bunch of stuff that they're going to be doing. All these people coming here are not our friends. The leaders in Washington won't enforce the law and protect you from the rampant crime that is destroying our inner cities and making them unlivable for families and children. And they even want to take away your ability to protect yourself by attacking lawful gun owners and slowly abolishing the Second Amendment. Meanwhile, they let hardened criminals out of jail while peaceful pro-life protesters and patriotic grandmothers who walk into the Capitol on January 6th are facing a decade or more in prison. Think about that. Think about that. And this is at a time when we live through the summer of BLM Antifa protests, burning down cities, destroying businesses, looting stores, with support from government officials and the biggest corporations on earth. The law is being used to constantly harass upstanding citizens while the real criminals go untouched. To our leaders, you and I are the enemy. Not the carjackers and the looters and the criminals who are running rampant in our cities. And now our justice system has been weaponized against the administration's top political competitor with absurd witch hunts from every corner of the country. It reminds me of the old Soviet slogan, you show me the man and I will find you the crime. They are throwing everything they have, think about it, everything they have they're throwing at President Trump because they're desperate to stop him, and they're desperate to stop you and me. Trump's only crime is representing the American people first. And for that, you know, for that, 
They're trying to put him in jail for the rest of his life, tie him up in court, take all of his assets. They are terrified of him. They are incredibly unfair. And if we allow this to happen, America will never be the same again. We have to stop it. It also seems like nothing even works in America anymore. Our public transit is unusable. Our streets are full of homelessness, litter, and filth. Think about all these things that are happening to us. And we need to be thinking about who does the best job that they're tasked to do, not diversity and inclusion and all this stuff. You know, we've made tremendous progress in those areas, and we don't need the government interfering and telling us who and what we should be doing. It really is ridiculous. And, you know, I'm the uh, chairman of the uh, Committee on uh, Nominations and Governance for one of the Fortune 500 companies. And uh, Glass Lewis recently said, don't vote for Carson, because the number of women on our board decreased to 25% after we added someone. They said, don't vote for Carson. How stupid are they? Because then if I leave, they got a diversity problem. So, <laughs> fortunately, the stockholders didn't pay me any attention. But, you know, our elections are rigged. The legacy media lies with impunity. And the government is just interested in power and control. On top of it all, we have a president who doesn't seem to know where he is half the time and often can't make it through a sentence and who a special counsel determined wasn't even mentally aware enough to have a trial. Now, if he can't be tried, he certainly can't hold his own at the negotiating table with world leaders in places like Russia, Iran, and China. So what makes him fit to be president? Think about it. It's total incompetence from top to bottom. And their solution is just chaos. Doubling down, continuing to lie, and counting on people being uninformed so they can tell them anything they want. And in the face of all of this, they're trying to gaslight us into rejecting what we see with our own eyes and say that none of this is really happening. We've come to an inflection point where big tech and the legacy media no longer reflect market demands, but they are instead using their money and influence to manufacture political consensus and shift public opinion in a non-organic way. Then they point the finger at us and say that we are the problem and tell us to disbelieve our own lying eyes and stop giving in to conspiracy theories. But the reality is that when the interests of all of our elite institutions are perfectly aligned and there's no need for a conspiracy at all. These people all went to the same schools. They believe all the same things. They're part of the same social, social circles, circles. And they attend the same elite cocktail parties. Washington has become a big revolving door of government bureaucrats, defense contractors, big tech operatives, and political lobbyists who jump from the public sector to the private life and back again every couple of years. Their ideolo ideologies are perfectly aligned, even if there's no central mechanism directing each of them individually. But the simple reality is that every American is struggling. And they can only hide that fact for so long. There's nothing radical about what we, the people, are demanding from our elected representatives. We want safety and security. We want freedom of speech and to practice our religion, as is our God-given right. We want secure borders. We want a government that puts our interests first. These are things that used to be the norm in this country. And none of these demands are extreme or outrageous. They should be the simple baseline of legitimate political leadership. All of this is a searing indictment of
of our ruling class, which shows exactly why Washington, D.C. is losing its legitimate claim to govern the American people. It was the late lieutenant turned academic Sir John Bagot Blood who first shared the idea that the average lifespan of the superpower is 250 years or about 10 generations. For those who keep track, our 250th birthday is coming up soon, July 4th, 2026 to be exact. Yet our leaders are determined to repeat every mistake that led to the collapse of empires before us. Here are just a few of the common themes from history. Mass immigration and infiltration by foreigners who don't share our values and culture or even our language. A loss of public morality, excess indulgence in wealth and luxury while shifting away from frugality and hard work. Rising inflation and massive amounts of public debt with out of control spending. Entangling foreign alliances and overcommitting ourselves to the defense of other countries, and finally, a rejection of religion, order, and even the concept of truth itself. And I have to say, as we reject God, we are spiraling downward. We need to bring them back and hurry. <laughs> This rejection of the past has always been at the core of the progressive movement. And we see it everywhere as progressivism has attacked our history, our heroes, and our inheritance itself. A country, and indeed any civilization that attacks itself like this, has lost its will to live and cannot survive. But in my travels across the nation, I'm encouraged. Let me thousands of God-fearing, liberty-loving American patriots who will not let their country be taken from them without a fight. As we enter the turbulent days ahead, we must stay true to our foundational values and true to our faith. We are Americans, and our nation is founded on trust in God's divine providence. With this guidance, I'm filled with confidence that the American spirit still strong and will reemerge from this challenge, bigger and better than ever before. We are the people who settled a vast and untamed wilderness, laid the railroads, put a phone in every home and a car in every garage. We are the people who built the skyscrapers, who engineered the bridges and the canals, who created the interstate highway system. We raised millions of people out of poverty. We took flight at Kitty Hawk. We stared down evil in its face and defeated Nazism and communism in the 20th century. And we unfurled our glorious American flag on the moon itself. We will not be like other superpowers who fought and forgot their values and rejected their past and fell from glory. Our great American story cannot end this way. It will not end this way. The tides are turning in our favor. And the simple fact is, the American people are not going to let our nation go. We understand the laws of nature, the nature's God, and the people who oppose those never survive. We won't survive if we oppose them. But as we enter this pivotal year, I hope that we all look to the heroes of our past to guide us in the present. We turn to scripture for our inspiration. We pray to God for the guidance we need to take back our country. I'm filled with hope for the future and confidence that America's best days are still ahead of us. Together, we can become the storage shiny hill on the city. Now, let me change that. The shiny city on the hill once again and secure the blessings of liberty to our children and our grandchildren for generations to come. And we must remember that we, the American people, are not each other's enemies. And we cannot succumb to those who are trying to divide us on the basis of race, age, income, gender, religion, political affiliation. We are neighbors, friends, and colleagues. Don't let anybody tell you that we are enemies. We are not, and our togetherness save us. God, thank you. God bless you.
and God bless the world. you guys here again at CPAC. This is always such a treat to come. But I'll tell you guys, we have our work cut out for us, don't we? It's almost hard to believe all that has happened in the world since Joe Biden took the office of the presidency. It's truly astonishing how much damage someone can do in only three years. The days of a soaring economy, safe and secure borders, and peace in the Middle East are gone. We're now seeing people work two and three jobs just to make ends meet. We have millions and millions of people flooding into our country illegally, of course given a red carpet rollout and reception by Joe and Kamala, and it feels like we are on the doorstep of World War III. But ladies and gentlemen, I come bearing good news here today, because less than nine months away, from changing all that, we will see Donald J. Trump elected as the 47th president. I can't wait to be back here with you one year from today under a Trump presidency because don't forget what America and the world looked like under the leadership of President Donald Trump. Historic trade agreements, a soaring economy, a safe and secure border, record low unemployment for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, women, our veterans, the genesis of the United States Space Force, peace agreements in the Middle East, the creation of over a million manufacturing jobs, the largest tax reform package in history, massive deregulation, energy independence, ladies and gentlemen. The appointment of not one, not two, but three Supreme Court justices to the bench. And that was just in four years. Today I look around, and I'm sure you do the same, and I truly do not recognize this country. How many of you go to the grocery store, the gas station, and you wonder, how did we get to this point? How many of you turn on the news at night and go to sleep worrying about the possibility of a world war? This is reality, and this is the America that Joe Biden created. You kind of have to ask yourself, what happened to the Democrat Party? It's a party that once stood for the working class, for women, for equal opportunity, and now seems to stand against all of those things. This is a party that has thrown away all of the values and foundations upon which our country was built, and instead embraced a platform that seems to consist of two tenets wokeness and a burning hot hatred for the one man they never saw coming, Donald J. Trump. The party of JFK is dead, now replaced by an ideology that stands against everything that makes us proud United Americans. When our founding fathers wrote the United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they used the ideals of equality freedom, and our Judeo-Christian values as their guides. Not socialism, identity politics, and a meritless society. And yet here we are, debating whether biological men are stronger than biological women, letting criminals run rampant in our big cities, and teaching our children to hate this country. I said it right here on this stage last year. This fight is not one between Republicans and Democrats or left versus right, but a fight between good and evil. It's a fight between those who want the United States to prosper and continue to be the leader of the free world, and those who want our country to crumble for the benefit of China, Russia, Iran, and every nation working to destroy us. The left told us what they wanted to do, fundamentally transform America. And I hate to point out the obvious, folks, but the transformation of the country we all know and love is happening right before our very eyes. It's happening right now as I speak, and it's happening faster than any of us even realize. Right now, our children, the next generation of leaders, are sitting in their classrooms being taught to despise our values. 
They're being taught victimhood and hatred as they're indoctrinated to their core against everything for which this country once stood. We all saw the atrocities in Israel on October 7th. The murder, rape, and torture of innocent people just going about their day-to-day lives. And the very next day, October 8th, what did we see? College students across America supporting the very terrorists who committed those despicable acts of violence. That's right, our own children here in the United States of America are still rallying and protesting across the country in support of Hamas, a terrorist organization who would love nothing more than to wipe Israel and the United States totally off the map. One thing is clear, ladies and gentlemen, the next generation of Americans is currently lost. Their futures and the future of the entire country hang by a thread. Now we've all heard it before, people say it every four years, the next election is consequential, the very future of the country depends on it. But this year, this November, the future of our country truly depends on it. It's not not hyperbole to say that your vote this November decides what becomes of America, and with that, the rest of the world. Now some of you may know, Eric and I are blessed to have two beautiful children our son Luke and our daughter, named after my home state, Carolina. And uh, yes, Carolina, we got North Carolina in the crowd, South Carolina. We got a big primary to win on Saturday in North Carolina, ladies and gentlemen, South Carolina. Um, every night, Eric and I have a tradition. We stop whatever we have going on and we go do bedtime with the kids. And why, while they say their prayers and the Pledge of Allegiance, of course, I often think to myself, what kind of country will they live in in 10, 20, or 30 years? What kind of country are we creating for our children and our grandchildren? I want my son to be proud of who he is. I want him to know that it's okay to be a patriot. It's okay to love God, and it is okay to grow up into a strong, masculine man. daughter to always feel safe here in America, wherever she goes. I want her to play sports on an equal footing with her peers, which means competing against other biological girls. And I want her to understand that in the United States of America, we get ahead and succeed by merit and merit alone. I will never raise her to rely even for one second on the poison and lie of identity politics. Moms and dads, hear me loud and clear. When I say it is up to us, the parents, to ensure the safety and the education of our children. Because whether it's our kids being forced to attend schools that continue to fail them, our kids indoctrinated with critical race theory, or the fabricated notion that you can change your gender like you change your shoes, we must remember it is up to us to protect them because our political leaders have proven they cannot be trusted to do that job. Children are a clean slate. They represent everything that's good in this world. Innocence, curiosity, a love for all, regardless of race, gender, or anything else. And shame on anyone who tries to steal that from them. So some of you may have heard that I've had the great honor of being endorsed by my father-in-law, President Trump, to co-chair the Republican National Committee. I got some fans in here, okay. You guys like this idea. Well, I'll tell you guys, this is a position for which I never imagined I would run, but I also never imagined that our country would be in such dire straits. It is time for change, it is time to fight, and it is time to win, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Now we know how the Democrats operate. They don't even try to hide it anymore. These are people so desperate to keep President Trump out of the Oval Office, they are willing to use tactics straight 
out of the communist playbook to try and subvert the will of we, the people. They cannot succeed. Now is our time to step up and fight back. Now is our time to say enough is enough. Now is our time to take back our country. And let me just assure everyone here of one thing. What happened in 2020 cannot and will not ever happen again. We must adapt and we must fight fire, not with fire, but with dynamite. We must and we will build the strongest, most secure election operation that this party has ever seen. That's how we have to do this, folks. But we got to adapt a little. As Republicans, I get it, we like to go vote on election day. It's exciting to be a part of that day. It's exciting to fill out the ballot for the future leader of our country. Heck, you even get a little sticker and then you can take a photo and post it on social media. I know, it's very fun. But the truth is, if we want to compete with the Democrats, we cannot wait until election day. If we want to compete and win, we must embrace early voting. The days of waiting until election day to vote are over. We have to encourage everyone who can legally vote to go do so as soon as they legally can. We need so many votes banked for Donald J. Trump that we're not playing catch up on election day. You go vote and then you take your neighbor, your friend, your dentist, heck, I don't care, someone you met on the street, as long as they're voting the right way, every single day up to and on November 5th, because this November, every single legal vote matters. So if elected as co-chair of the RNC, I can promise you, we will not be giving blank checks to career political consultants and vendors. Every penny of every dollar donated will go towards one thing, winning. I promise you that I will do everything in my power to fight for our country, our party, our values, our children, secure elections, and everything else that we all care about in this country. As you know, in 2015, our family was new, shall we say, maybe a better word is naive to politics. When my father-in-law announced his candidacy for president of the United States, nothing really could have prepared us for what was to come. In the last eight years, we have seen and experienced some of the most vicious and evil things. The kind of things I never dreamed that we would ever actually see happen in the United States of America. Let's all remember that right now, Joe Biden continues to weaponize his own Department of Justice against the man that is beating him in the polls and is his number one political opponent. This is straight out of the Soviet Union, ladies and gentlemen. But despite all those vicious attacks and indictments and lawsuits that, of course, my family has had to endure over the last eight years, we will never stop fighting for this country. It is because of these attacks, not in spite of them, that we continue to fight. And I think my father-in-law, Donald Trump, said it best. My revenge will be success. The United States of America, as young as we are, has seen many challenges, weathered many storms, and despite it all, we have always only grown stronger. America may be fractured, but she is not broken because the American people do not cower. We do not bend, we do not break, we stand strong in our values and our principles and everything that makes us a part of the single greatest country that this world has ever seen. Never forget, ladies and gentlemen, that it is always darkest before the dawn. D-O-N, darkest before the dawn. See what I did? And I believe that Donald Trump was made for such a time as this. So before I go, I just want
want to say thank you to you guys. We have a lot of work to do. We have a little time to do it. It will be my great honor to work alongside each and every one of you to put President Donald J. Trump back in that White House, expand our lead in the House, take back the Senate, and make America great again. Thank you guys. God bless you.